Um, there's a lot in that chapter in Ephesians um, chapter 5, but the part I want to focus on tonight is the command given, given in verse 18, which says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So the title of my sermon tonight is Be Filled with the Spirit. Now, if there's ever a, a day that we need to be filled with God's Spirit, it's today. Amen. If you think about it, the church is under attack like never before from the media and from all sorts of different uh, places and the family unit is under attack like never before. Yep. Uh, being a man, uh, uh, as the Bible explains what a man is, is under attack. Manhood is under attack. Womanhood is under attack by feminism and so many other wicked things. So if there's ever a, a day we need to be filled with the Spirit, it's today. Right. And often when it comes to um, being filled with the Spirit, we often we think about, well, when I do spiritual things, that's when I need to be filled with the Spirit. Like when I go to do soul winning, I need to be filled with the Spirit, and rightly so. And when I need to go and pray, well, I need to be filled with the Spirit. But in every avenue of life that God calls us to, we need to be filled with the Spirit. You might be a mother at home homeschooling. You need to do that filled with the Spirit. You can be just as filled with the Spirit at home teaching your kids yeah. as Pastor Kevin can be preaching the Gospel door to door. We need to be filled with the Spirit. If you might just be working for a boss, you need to be filled with the Spirit because you're working for Jesus Christ. And if you work with that mindset that I'm not working for a, a boss but I'm working for Jesus and he will fill you with, your whole, with the Holy Spirit while you do that. And you might be a husband at home. Well, you need to be a husband filled with the Holy Spirit. You might be a mother, a wife. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not just for spiritual things. Yeah. And if maybe you want to see some uh, improvement in your marriage, well, be filled with the Spirit. If you're the husband, be filled with the Spirit. If you're the wife, be filled with the Spirit. And you'll be surprised how better your, your household will be Amen. if you focus on being filled with the Holy Spirit in everything that you do. So turn to, um, I'll get you to turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. But before I want to talk about how we are filled with the Holy Spirit, first of all, I want to look at is how that we first receive the Holy Spirit. Because there's so much false teaching out there today regarding the Holy Spirit. So I want to look at the foundation of how we first receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you're in John chapter 7. Now, but I guess tonight you guys are kind of like my guinea pigs. I'm going to be preaching this down in Sydney on Tuesday night. So if you can either give me any advice on how I can fine tune it, let me know, I'll take your advice on board. So turn to John chapter 7, verse 37, and tonight we're going to be firstly looking at how we, uh, how we first receive the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to look at how we then walk in being constantly filled with the Holy Spirit in the things that God calls us to, calls us to do. Verse 37, it says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man first, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So we can see there that the Holy Spirit is given to those that believe on him. Amen. So we see you believe on Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Galatians chapter 3 verse 14, if you could turn there. So have your Bibles handy or your iPhones, whatever you have, because we're going to be jumping around a fair bit tonight. So, so try and keep up. Galatians chapter 3 verse 14 says that the blessing of Abraham might come, upon, might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So it says there, you receive the Spirit when you receive the blessing of Abraham. If the blessing of Abraham has come upon you, it's so that you might then receive the Spirit. So what is the, uh, the blessing of Abraham? Let's have a look at Romans chapter 4. Turn to Romans chapter 4 verse 20. Romans 4 verse 20. So we're having a look at what the blessing of Abraham, Abraham is. And it says here, talking about Abraham, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. In verse 21 there, we get a really good definition of what it means to have faith, what it means to believe on Jesus Christ. It says there, and being fully persuaded. So the person who believes on Jesus Christ for salvation is fully persuaded 
of the gospel. Amen. They're not half convinced. They're not still thinking, maybe it's true. Maybe I still need to turn from my sins. They're fully convinced that gospel is true. And Abraham was fully convinced that God could deliver on his promise. And therefore, it was imputed to him as righteousness. He was fully convinced, fully persuaded of God's promise. And verse 23, And it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So if we believe on Jesus, and we're pu- uh, fully persuaded of the gospel that God rose Jesus from the dead, we will be saved and God's righteousness, just like it was to Abraham. Abraham was blessed by receiving God's imputed righteousness by faith, without works. And that's the blessing of Abraham. And if we believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have God's imputed righteousness without works by faith. And therefore we have received the blessing of Abraham that we may receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So if you're saved, it's that you might receive the Holy Spirit through faith. I like it says there at the end, I like it how it says, if we believe on him that raised up our Lord from the dead. It reminds me of Romans 10.9 where it says, that, um, that if you confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in how that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That might not be exactly word for word. It's that resurrection part of the gospel we need to make sure that we emphasise. Uh, it's emphasised there in Romans 4 and also in Romans 10, 9. So when we go soul winning, we need to make sure that we focus in there on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we receive the blessing of Abraham once we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and was saved, that we might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to continue to drive this point home. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to see that the Bible is really consistent on this teaching that once you believe on Jesus Christ for salvation, you receive the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. And this is a great... Uh, verse that we use when we go soul winning from time to time, we teach on eternal security. In him in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So we see there again, after ye believed the gospel, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We receive the Holy Spirit. You're sealed at the moment that you believe the gospel. Acts 15. Turn to Acts chapter 15. Now we're going to see here Peter retelling the story that happened in Acts 10 when Cornelius and his household got saved by listening to Peter's preaching. So Peter's going to retell the story and let's just have a look at what the Bible says there and what Peter says. Verse 7. Acts 15, verse 7. And when there, when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, in the next verse, it gives us a bit of insight into God's perspective when it comes to salvation. Okay, we know our end, we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we're saved. The next verse allows you to have a bit of a glimpse from God's perspective, looking down on the person getting saved. It's really interesting. I love this verse. And verse 8, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Verse 9, And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So we can see God is looking at people's hearts. When we go out soul winning, preaching the gospel, God's looking at people's hearts. Yeah. When we're giving the gospel door to door, he's waiting and watching to see if that person is going to be fully persuaded of the gospel message that we're uh, presenting. And if they do believe it, God's going to bear witness. How does he bear witness? By giving them the Holy Ghost. Yeah. So we can see it's super consistent. The Bible's clear, passage after passage. You believe the gospel, you, you receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Acts 5. Turn to Acts 5 so you're not too far from Acts chapter 5. So we're starting to see here that if you have believed on Jesus for salvation, you have received the promise of the Holy Spirit. 
Acts 5, verse 32. Acts 5, verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. So the Holy Spirit is given to them that obey him. So what do we need to obey to receive the Holy Spirit? Romans 6.17. Turn to Romans 6.17. Romans 6, verse 17. Told you we're going to be jumping around a fair bit today. But it's such an important doctrine, we need to show it from the Word of God. So there's so much garbage and nonsense and false teaching that goes on without any scripture at all, and that's why we need to preach from the Bible when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Amen. But let's be clear on, clear on the Word of God what it says about how to receive the Holy Spirit and how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Romans 6.17 And God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. What form of doctrine do you think that is? I think it might be the gospel. I think it might be the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have obeyed. You have obeyed. So what if you don't obey? Well, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Colossians. How do you say that? Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. A bit of a tongue twister. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So if we look at if you obey the gospel, you're saved, you receive the Holy Spirit, you're sealed forever, you're going to go to heaven no matter what. If you don't obey, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So we can see that if you obey not the gospel, you will be punished everlasting destruction and we know ultimately that's going to be in the lake of fire so if you obey the gospel you receive the holy spirit if you don't obey you receive the fire of god the everlasting the lake of fire and everlasting destruction if you obey the gospel you receive the holy spirit all mankind falls into two of those groups those who obey the gospel and you're saved for eternity receive the holy spirit if you don't obey you will be uh, under god's wrath forever in the lake of fire Suffering everlasting destruction. So, so far we've looked at that we receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the gospel. I think that's pretty clear. Okay, And if you want to continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit, well, just continue to obey God. Continue to obey God's commandments. Continue to obey Jesus' teachings. And continue to obey the Bible we have in, in my hand right now, the King James Bible. So turn to John chapter 14. <clears throat> John chapter 14. Verse 15. John 14 verse 15. Let's have a look at what, what the Bible says there. It says, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. This is Jesus speaking. So he's saying, if you love me, Keep my commandments. And we know that it's impossible in the flesh to keep his commandments. Because we know for centuries people would try to keep the, the commandments in the law and failed and couldn't do it. So Jesus dropped this, drops this bomb on us saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. But he doesn't leave us without help to obey them. If you look at the next verse. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then he says, but I'll send you the comforter. I'll send you the Holy Spirit to help you to do that. Okay. Have a look at um, the next verse, verse uh, 13. How be it, no, verse 17, verse 17 of John 14, 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So there's a connection there between keeping his commandments and having the comforter and having the Holy Spirit. So you can't keep the commandments unless you have the Holy Spirit. And if you want to keep the commandments, well, God's going to give you the Holy Spirit to do that. As a saved person, you keep the commandment, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. you receive the Holy Spirit. And if you want to continue at that point to obey the commandments... Guess what? You'll be continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit, like the commandment given by Paul in Ephesians 5.18. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. How do you be filled with the Holy Spirit? Keep on obeying. We have the comfort to help us to do that. Turn to John 16, so just a couple of pages over. John 16. 
And verse 13. And we're going to read a bit more about the Holy Spirit, what he does, how he helps. Verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Verse 14. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. So we can see there, when the Holy Spirit is at, at work, what, what does he do? He glorifies Jesus and shows you the word of God. So if you're in a meeting and a man is being glorified, a man is up there on the platform and people are idolising that man or woman, looking at that person and thinking, this person is a great speaker, look at all the wonderful stories they've got to tell. Is that really the work of the Holy Spirit? Because it says here in my Bible, John 16, that the Holy Spirit was, will glorify me, meaning Jesus, will glorify Jesus Amen. and will show it unto you all the things which are Jesus and or Jesus is, will show it unto you. Verse 15, all things that the Father have a mind, therefore said I that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. This is what is from Jesus, is, is the word of God. So when the Holy Spirit is at work, the, whole, the, the word of God is going to be lifted up and Jesus is going to be glorified. A man is not going to be glorified. The giftings on a man is not going to be glorified. The word of God is going to be glorified. And if you don't see that happening, well, you can rest assured that the Holy Spirit is not at work in that church or in that person's life. Okay, the Holy Spirit, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be filled with the words of God. You'll be speaking the words of God and you'll be testifying to Jesus. Remember, Revelation uh, 19, let me just turn there. Revelation 19, I think it is. Yep, Revelation 19, 10. Let me read it to you. And I fell at his feet to worship him. This is the great apostle John. And he said unto me, See thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when the Holy Spirit is at work, He's testifying of Jesus. He's not testifying of how awesome you are. He's not testifying of the great plans God has for your life. He's testifying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The great plan God has for your life is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the great plan God has for your life. And you need to make sure that when you're in a church, that it's the Holy Spirit that's at work. It's not a false spirit declaring how great a man is, declaring how great you are, and not lifting up the Word of God. How many meetings... Have I been in, maybe you've been in, where the, 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 pre the, the preacher gets up here, says one or two scriptures, if that, and then for an hour waffles on about stories, visions, his vain imaginations. Yeah. Holy Spirit is not at work in that person. If you're in a church like that, you're not right with God. I'll say that right now. I can say that because yeah. I've been in churches like that myself and I wasn't right with God when I was so in what? those churches. You need to be in a church where the Holy Spirit is at work where the word of God is lifted up and exalted and Jesus Christ is glorified. Amen. You need to be in a church like that. And I'll tell you now, I spent 20 years in the wilderness trying to find the right church. And there's a very small remnant in the world today of churches that are New Testament churches preaching the word of God, glorifying Jesus and actually doing the work. Yeah. And they're independent fundamental Baptist churches. I'm sure there's some out there somewhere that um, are you know, remote places in the world. Some are doing it right, though, but the ones that i found are ISB churches. So don't waste your time in bad churches. Man, Turn to you know. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. So the Holy Spirit doesn't just show you the Word of God and reveal it to you. He also gives you the power to live it, if you want to. The power to, to obey the commandments of God. So turn to Acts chapter 1. I want to show you that the, the Holy Spirit gives us power in our lives. So Acts chapter 1 verse 4. Acts chapter 1 verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptised with water, but ye shall be baptised with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons 
which the Father hath put in his own power. But verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And the most utter, most uttermost parts of the earth includes the Sunshine Coast. So here we are today. And so we're going to receive that power from God when the Holy Spirit comes upon us to do what? to obey the Great Commission, to be witnesses, to preach the gospel, to go into all the world like Jesus commanded them to do, to do the work. So God commands them to go into all the world, preach the gospel, then he gives them the power to do it. He commands us, go into all the Caloundra, Sunshine Coast and beyond, and preach the gospel, and he gives us the power to do it. When you are saved, you're given the power. Yeah. And if you walk in obedience to God's commandments, you'll continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit like um, Ephesians 5.18 says, Don't be drunk with wine, where it is excess, excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's a command. He has to command us to do it, because if we don't do it, we're not going to be able to do the work. Yeah. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. <coughs> While you're turning there, let me read to you a few more verses. So you're turning to 2 Peter chapter 1. And let me read to you, Luke 24, 49, it says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So what's it mean to be a son of God? Uh, Romans 8, 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. How do you be led by the Spirit of God? By being filled with the Holy Spirit. He will lead you to be obedient to Jesus' commandments, to be obedient to the Word of God, and then you'll be living like a son of God. And he gives us the power for the Holy Spirit to, be, to become sons of God. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. Amen. And the love and of a sound mind. And this is the first verse I ever memorised. The pastor, back when I was 19, showed me this one here. And I just said, well, that's amazing. God has not given us a spirit of fear. We don't need to have any fear. Yeah. When the Muslims are coming after you, when the news media is coming after you, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Amen. But a power and love and of a sound mind. So we don't need to be fearful. So if we start to feel tempted to be fearful, persecution comes or some sort of... Um, uh, attack of the enemy comes, we have to realise, well, God's not giving me this spirit of fear. Yeah. It's not from God. He gives me a spirit of power right. and love and a sound mind. So you're on 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, just jump down to the second verse. We'll start at verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life, and godliness. So it's not just pertaining to preaching the gospel, it's pertaining to unto life. Whatever God's called you to be in life. God might have called you to be a father, a, a business person. He, he wants you to have his power to help you to do that. You might just be working um, for a boss. Well, God's given you his power yep. to do that. Yep. You might be a homeschool mum. God's given you his power to do that. You can be the most awesomest homeschool mum filled with the Holy Spirit and do a better job than the highest educated secular teacher in the public right. school system. If you're yeah. filled with the Holy Spirit, you can be, do an incredible job of God's wisdom, God's knowledge. You can be um, ex extremely blessed doing that role as you do it, filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll be filled with joy as you do that. You'll be filled with love, peace, Amen. and uh, you'll love it. Yeah. So I'll just pick up again in verse... Three, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Well, so we've seen so far that we receive the Holy Spirit when you believe on Jesus. You will receive the Holy Spirit at that point. And if you want to continue to be filled, just continue to do the work God's called you to do. Continue to obey and you'll continue to be filled. Now, I do want to touch on a bit of error or a lot of error that, that I've come across over the years. And this is my first-hand experience. 
Um, you know, been a Pentecostal, charismatic church since I was 19, since I was first, just after I was saved. And you see a lot of nonsense that goes on about the Holy Spirit in those churches. And what, what I've seen over the years is a lot of people would just seek the Holy Spirit to have an experience, to have an, an encounter or receive some sort of manifestation from the Holy Spirit. That's what I've, what I've witnessed over the years. And we've seen here that people don't receive the Holy Spirit by seeking to, to, to um, have an experience with the Holy Spirit. First of all, you receive the Holy Spirit by seeking Jesus and you begin, continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit as you continue to obey the commandments and the teachings in the Word of God. Okay, so you do see a lot of nonsense out there. And um, I've been exposed to things like um, uh, in different churches where they, they, they're waiting for God to manifest like glory clouds and gold dust and oil, waiting for oil and gems to appear on your palms of your hands. And you know, I've, I've been in meetings where preachers have been up here saying, oh, God's oil is just falling on my hand. These are just bizarre manifestations and they're not in the Bible. The Holy Spirit doesn't... T- See, that's, who's that glorifying? That's not glorifying Jesus. That's not lifting up the Word of God. That's you elevating that preacher, that teacher, as someone who's got some very unique gift from God that God chooses to manifest himself in, in that special way. And people talk about having portals at different places to go to heaven and be transferred to different places all around the world. That's some of the bizarre stuff that goes on. I guess you've been in Pentecostal church and may have come across some sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's pretty, pretty wild and pretty crazy. When I... I got saved when I was 19, and the next year in 1995, because I didn't, didn't know any better, I just thought, well, these guys, because my neighbours were um, Christian at least in a pastor, so I thought, well, I got saved now, and now I need to go to a church, and maybe the, a Pentecostal church is a bit more exciting than my Mount Anglican church. And those are two options I had, so I joined a Pentecostal church, and the next year, I was at a, anyone heard of Rodney Howard Brown? Yes. Yeah, so I was at a Rodney Howard Brown crusade, been saved not even a year um, in Sydney at the um, C3 church there, Phil Pringles church, and it was just the free for all garbage. It was just nonsense. Like at the time, I'm thinking, this is really weird. You know, Ronnie Howard Brown laid hands on everybody, including me, and nothing happened to me, thank God. And other people just going crazy, falling, falling out under some sort of other spirit. Because you know it's not God's spirit, it's another spirit. You know, you know it's not God at work. And it's just wicked and bizarre and crazy and just full of Pentecostal shenanigans. You know, just, and it took me a long time to see through that. Because I thought, well, how come you never touched me like that, God? How come you never touched me? I thought, well, there's something wrong with me. But God doesn't love me like he loves these other people. But then he did love me, and that's why he protected me from that, because I was his child. So God is very gracious and, and long-suffering too. And, um, but, but I could never go back to a church like that now. I could never, I would just be, wouldn't be right with God if I went back to even visit a church like that. Well, sometimes I'm tempted to, to go back and cause trouble, you know, but I, I do. I wouldn't mind going back and saying, tell me about how you, how you got saved. You know? <laughs> so, so much error there, but I really thank God that we, we have a church like this from the Sunshine Coast that we can be part of. So, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. But, but a true man of God, a true believer, will never exalt experiences above the Word of God. Like, you're not, you're going to, because if you think about it, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, well, the Holy Spirit's going to be elevating the Word of God, drawing, drawing your attention to the Word of God, not experiences, not feelings and, and goosebumps and emotions. Okay, have a look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Uh, I want to read you, to here, read you some, some verses here. It says here, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we have made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So Peter's talking about a spiritual experience that he had. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard, which is on the Mount Transfiguration, in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved, beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice came from, uh, sorry, verse 18, and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. And we, uh, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. 
So Peter's saying, even though I've had this amazing experience of seeing Jesus glorified, I have a more sure word, and that's just the word of prophecy. That's just the word of God. So a true man of God, like Peter, is not going to lift up experiences and boast about experiences, but will lift up the word of God. Amen. So the question I ask, well, why would these Pentecostals, Charismatics, and it's not just those churches, like this uh, teaching has sort of crept into a lot of different churches these days, and again, it seems like it's just the... Um, IFB churches, which are, uh, for the most part, keep this sort of nonsense out. But why do people seek after these manifestations and these experiences? Well, I'll tell you this. It's because they have no assurance of their salvation. So they're seeking to have an experience to validate that they're saved, to validate their relationship with God. That's my experience. Because they don't have any assurance of their salvation because, for the most part, Pentecostals aren't saved. I will say, say this. There are some saved Pentecostals um, in Pentecostal churches. Same, uh, some saved believers in those Pentecostal churches. But for the most part, they're not saved because they don't preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, they don't have the personal assurance from the Holy Spirit that they are saved. Because if you were saved, you would be settled. You know I'm saved by the Holy Spirit. Witnesses to me that I've received the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm saved, but they don't have that, so they chase after some other experience to validate them. So if you have an experience where you've seen an angel of light, and this angel of light says to you, oh, you're my chosen son or daughter, I'm going to send you to the far ends of the earth to preach the gospel for me, you're thinking, oh, I'm saved. I am certainly saved, because this angel came and told me this special mes- message from God, but it, you know, the devil comes an angel of light. Yeah. And so many people with these experiences. Well, these sort of, they are real encounters. You know, I've met people that, I've never had anything like this happen to me, but I know people who have, and they did have those experiences. Now, so you might say to me, well, Jason, you've convinced me. Um, I, I do believe that we only receive the Holy Spirit when, when we're saved, and the Holy Spirit is only... Uh, given to us so that we can obey the commandments, so that we can glorify Jesus. But what about the baptism in the Holy Spirit? The Pentecostals teach, once you're saved, that's one thing, but now what you need to have is a second experience called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. They'll teach, if you're saved, the, the Holy Spirit bears witness with you that you're his, but you don't have the Holy Spirit. Or they might say, you have the Spirit of Jesus, but you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. And they'll say, you now, now you had, need to have a second experience. And this is always a bit strange to me because when I got saved, um, I felt like God gave me his, his spirit. And my, my understanding was, in, the, in that moment when I called upon the name of the Lord, I was saved and I knew, well, this must be what it, what it means to become born again. And for me, there was never any second experience. But when I um, joined the Pentecostal church, um, I remember the pastor laying hands on me and saying, now you're going to speak in tongues, you're going to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. And there's nothing happened at all. Like, thank God. And other people there had the same thing happen to them. They started talking in these unknown tongues and crazy stuff and manifestations. And wow, don't you like me, God? <laughs> is what I was thinking. <laughs> and so the Pentecostals believe you have to have a second experience of being baptised in the Holy Spirit. But I want to show you right now, and just debunk that once and for all, that the, the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not a second experience. So turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Now this is the uh, account given by the Holy Spirit as the, the Holy Spirit narrates to us um, the story of or the account of Cornelius and his household getting saved. Acts 10, verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, so this is Peter finishing up preaching the gospel to Cornelius and his household, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, see, what's Peter doing? He's speaking words. Like he's filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking words. He's not doing tricks. He's not trying to impress them with um, signs and wonders. He's just preaching the words. He's preaching the gospel. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptised which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So we see there they've believed the gospel as Peter's preached it and the Holy Spirit has acknowledged their hearts by giving them the Holy Spirit and they've received the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost fell on them and they have received everlasting life. They've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And now turn to Acts chapter 11. Uh, Verse 15. Now this is Peter retelling the story. It's Peter retelling the story of what happened in Acts 10. Acts 11 verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Talking about what happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Then I remembered the word of the Lord. How that he said, John indeed baptised with water, but ye shall be baptised with the Holy Ghost. Amen. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? So we see Paul, uh, Peter here uses the terminology to saying that they were baptised in the Holy Spirit to to, to say when they believed on on the Lord Jesus Christ, when they received the Holy Spirit, well that's being baptised in the Holy Spirit, it's the same thing. So being baptised in the Holy Spirit is the same as receiving the Holy Spirit when you're saved. It's not a second experience. So, turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. We want to look at what John the Baptist said, because John the Baptist also talked about receiving uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. It says, John the Baptist preaching, I indeed baptise you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptise you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So John the Baptist says here, look, I'm just baptising with water, but there's coming one after me that will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. So it's interesting that John the Baptist would use the terminology baptised in the Holy Spirit because it's just relevant to what he's doing because he's baptising people with water, so it's relevant to what's happening. So then to emphasise the greatness of Jesus, he's saying, well, Jesus is going to baptise you with the Holy Spirit, meaning he'll give you the Holy Spirit. That's what what John the Baptist there is saying. But we see an extra point there where... Um, John the Baptist says, and with fire. So he'll baptise you with the Holy Spirit, and with fire. So we have to realise there that there's a multitude of people come out to see John the Baptist as Pharisees and scribes and, and saved people, unsaved people. And he says to them, he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, and with fire. So, and I believe the next verse there, verse 12, explains what he means by and with fire. That's my um, understanding of that. Like some people might interpret that differently. So basically he's saying, you're going to be baptised with the Holy Ghost or you're going to be baptised with fire. So it's just like if you obey the Gospel, you're going to be baptised with the Holy Spirit. If you don't obey the Gospel, well you'll be baptised in the lake of fire. Okay, so he'll baptise you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Meaning the people there watching, you know, some of you are going to be baptised with the Holy Ghost if you believe the Gospel, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't, or you can be baptised in fire, the unquenchable fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up all the chaff with unquenchable fire. So if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're that chaff. Now, I just want to give you a warning now. <clears throat> Turn to Thessalonians chapter 2. So after we've, we've seen here from the Bible, it's crystal clear that the Holy Spirit is given, you're baptised in the Holy Spirit, you receive the Holy Spirit, it's all the same thing, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's no second experience. And, and a lot of what goes on in, in churches today is not consistent what we looked at here today. Okay, so we see a warning here to, to the lost, and also I believe it can be applied to uh, the saved. So 2, uh, Thessalon- two Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verse 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 10. And with all deceivableness 
of unrighteousness in them, in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, they that, all might, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So I believe that's a warning uh, that can apply to those that choose to believe a lie. So they hear the gospel, they reject it, and they, in the, in the um, framework of like Pentecostalism and the charismatic churches, people can hear the gospel and say, no, I reject that, I want to continue to believe the false gospel um, of what they preach in this church. And if they continue to reject the truth of God's word, it says there, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. It can come to the point where they cross the line with God, where God then chooses to send them a strong delusion of believing all this nonsense, all this extra biblical revelations and gold dust and portals to heaven and, and um, angel feathers and gemstones, all that sort of stuff. If they choose to believe all that garbage when they've heard the truth, it comes to the point where God will send them strong delusion, when God will purposely deceive that person. And if God's against you, if God's deceived you, then there's no hope for you. There's no hope. And also it can apply to people like myself that were in Pentecostal churches um, that did hear the truth and, and were saved but then were caught up in all this nonsense. If I, hadn't, if I had continued in that church after I knew better, after I knew it was all wickedness and lie, lies, I believe God would have set me strong delusion. Not that I would have lost my salvation but there would have been no more place found for me of repentance. Meaning I could never repent and then get back to where it ought to have been if I had continued to believe that lie after I knew better as a saved person. And I think that's what you'll find Hebrews 6 is talking about also. You can get to the point where you cross the line with God as a saved person where he'll just say, okay, then I've tried to get you to, to live the life I, I wanted you to live. Now there's no repentance for you. You can't recover from that. And I think this is a warning which I would have applied to me if I had to continue on after I knew better in those Pentecostal churches. So thank God for that, that he does uh, bring the word of God, he does bring the truth to God's people that are in those churches to call them out. And that's what we need to do. We need to come out from among them and be separate. Okay? And God will receive us. Yeah. Now, I just want to briefly close uh, looking at some examples in Acts of the Apostles, how they continued on to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And just see if, it, if it's consistent with what goes on in, in some churches, which we know it's not, but let's have a look and compare um, these experiences of Pentecostal churches to what the uh, Word of God says. Acts chapter 4, verse 18. Acts chapter 4, verse 18. <clears throat> so here we have the Apostles preaching the Gospel and they're starting to cop some severe persecution as, as they're doing that. Verse 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done, which was the miracle of that old man who was... I won't say old, but the man that was 40. For the man was above 40 years old on whom his, uh, this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. Let's see how they responded uh, to this persecution. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, he by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, and with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together to, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Now, Lord, this is their, their response, Behold their threat, threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy words. So they're praying for boldness to continue to obey the Great Commission with boldness. They want, they, want, they want more boldness. So they're not shrinking away. They're not going, oh, okay, then we better, you know, we better tone down the preaching. We better not preach so hard. So what's the response? Verse 30. And they continue to pray, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and the signs of wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Verse 31. 
And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. So we see they prayed for more boldness to keep obeying, to keep preaching the gospel. And God saw that and thought, great, you guys want to keep doing what I command? They were filled with the Holy Ghost again. And they rolled around the floor and picked up all the gemstones. <laughs> and they picked up all the, the angel dust and they went through a portal to heaven. No? They, and they spake the word of God with boldness. That's what, that's what you do. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you speak the word of God with boldness. That's why we go soul winning. Because we're filled with the Holy Ghost. So we go speak the word. Confrontational soul winning. We ask them the question, do you know for sure you're going to go to heaven? And we don't put a, a coat hanger on their door. Why? Because we're filled with the Holy Ghost and we want to... The letterbox is not going to get saved. Forget the letterbox. <laughs> also obey God rather than man. So they were so full of the Holy Ghost. They didn't try and get the letterbox saved. They preached the word of God with boldness. And um, uh, just... Just about finished now. Go down to Acts chapter 5. Acts, 5, Acts chapter 5, verse 27. And they're getting more persecution. More, more persecution is coming. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. And Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. So they're full of the Holy Ghost and they're going to obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you slew. What's he doing here? He's pre- preaching the word of God. Whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him have God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a saviour for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Now we are his witnesses of these things and so also is the Holy Ghost and God have given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Jump down to verse 40. Jump down to verse 40. And to him they agreed, which is uh, the, the um, Gamaliel. Uh, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So they were so filled with the Holy Ghost by this point, it was no big deal. They just rejoiced Amen. at the persecution. So filled with the Holy Ghost. Now have a look at this, verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they continued to preach in the, in the face of severe persecution. So there we go. So if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you're going to be doing the works of God. You're going to be preaching the gospel like the apostles. And if you pray for boldness to go soul winning, uh, you're going to be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit. And we can see it's consistent there in the Bible, isn't it? You receive the Holy Ghost by believing on Jesus and you stay filled with the Holy Ghost by being obedient to Jesus, by obeying the commandments. And that's how we can obey Ephesians 5.18. Be filled with the Holy Spirit by obeying God and um, continuing on to do the work in the face of um, severe persecution. Let me just close by just reading you a couple of verses. And don't turn there. Romans 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye are bound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. For I'm, I myself am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. And last verse. This is uh, from uh, Acts 5, verse 25. Uh, no, Acts 13, 52, sorry. And all the disciples, and I'm just going to interject these, these words here, and all the disciples in Caloundra were filled with, the, filled with joy Amen. and with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. There you go.